Testing. Sounds good. Are we streaming? Great. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to the lovely Ehrlicher Room here at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm Christian Sandvig. I'm a professor in the School of Information and in the Department of Communication Studies. And it's my pleasure to be able to introduce the speaker today. I'll start by saying a little bit about the series. Um, then I'll introduce the speaker, and then I'll turn it over to the speaker. So let me start by saying um, I'd like to thank the generous sponsors for their sponsorship of the series. Um, this talk is brought to you by the Department of Communication Studies, the Center for Political Studies, and the School of Information, all at Michigan. And this talk is actually part of what we're calling the soft opening of a new research center here at the University of Michigan, and that is the Center for Ethics, Society, and Computing. You may have noticed that that spells escape. Escape, escape was a key added to the computer keyboard when it was realized that the operator of the computer needed a way to intervene and to stop a computer program that was producing some undesirable result. So that's both the name of the center, Escape, and the mission. This is the third in our series of three talks on the ethics and politics of artificial intelligence. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our speaker today, um, Professor Tarleton Gillespie from MSR and Cornell. Um, I've known Tarleton for a number of years. It's actually an interesting unplanned thing that I don't know if some of you noticed, but I was planning to read some of the glowing review uh, of his book that I believe he will talk about today. It was reviewed widely, but I was thinking of um, reading the review in science. Um, and I noticed that the previous speaker in our series wrote the review. Um, so I thought, well, does that diminish its credibility or does it improve the credibility of the previous speaker or the speaker series organizer? I don't know. <laughs> but in, in any case, let me say that um, Tarleton Gillespie is the author of Custodians of the Internet, which has been um, widely cited and well-reviewed, including in science by our previous speaker. Um, as, a, as a timely and relevant and important book related to uh, what's been called the private law system of governance that decides what people are allowed to say online. Um, I believe that's what he's going to talk about today. He's also a distinguished speaker uh, and uh, researcher um, known for a variety of contributions, but unfortunately, because we have such a limited time together, I'm not going to give him the full introduction that he deserves and just say that we're very glad to have him, and with that, I'll turn it over to Tarleton Gillespie. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to Christian especially and everyone who helped organize this visit. And it is exciting to be part of this soft opening. Uh, excited for what this center is becoming and, and its connections to the School of Information and Communication Studies and the whole campus. Um, so uh, for even those in the room who don't study content moderation or social media platforms, um, it's probably quite obvious that there has been a sort of growing public and journalistic concern over how platforms make these decisions about who belongs on their site, what's possible to say, and what's to be done uh, when they dispute that issue. Uh, and this concern has arguably grown in light of um, some particularly pernicious problems, both on the platform and off. And they're the kinds of pernicious problems that I think historically are the ones that test our assumptions about um, public information, the public sphere, and those who, uh, who contribute to it. Um, for some of you in the room, it'll be uh, not surprising to know that this is not a new phenomenon. This question about what platforms are doing, what kind of choices they're making about the content that they circulate, even as they promise generally to be sort of wide open environments, um, has been going on since their genesis. Um, criticism of their rules and their tactics, uh, as well as uh, problems that challenge them, users that try to uh, subvert their rules, and users frustrated by uh, the platform's efforts or lack thereof. But I, I think it's w accurate to say that the questions have been growing, and I think that in the last few years we've been seeing deeper questions. So there was a kind of an ongoing drumbeat in the tech press early on that sounded something like, what Adobe decision this platform made, you wouldn't believe it. And that was kind of the level of concern, right? They make mistakes or they fail to address certain kinds of things. 
And I think in the last few years, we're seeing a deeper set of questions. How and why do platforms moderate? How do they make these choices? How should they be doing so? What's the labor involved? Who's doing this work? And what are the implications of that? What are the economic and political motivations for how they do it? And what are the ramifications for how they do it and, and when they fa arguably fail? So I, I, I believe that looking closely at content moderation, how it really works and its real implications, can be a kind of prism for examining what platforms are and what they've come to be and how they subtly torque public life and public community. Um, but I argue in the book that one of the things we have to do first is we have to kind of fundamentally rethink what platforms are. I think that even those of us who've thought about them for a long time may be susceptible to a certain vision of what platforms are that has been constructed by them, has been a sort of convenient way of understanding. And I think moderation, looking at moderation and understanding the role it plays, can help us do that, can help us do that rethinking. Um, I want to argue that moderation haunts social media platforms um, and their rise to prominence and sort of dominance in the public space. In some ways, it is the connective tissue between the promise and the reality of uh, what platforms offer, a bridge between our proclaimed uses of them and our actual uses of them, uh, and the bridge between the promise and the limits of governance by technology. And in some ways, it's the shadow cast by our faith in information as frictionless, uh, communication systems as impartial conduits, um, business models premised on advertising and data collection being somehow compatible with public needs, um, and something as fundamental as sociality being something we believe as consensual and equitable. Right? There's a shadow cast by either the, each of those notions, and moderation is in the ugly space of having to grapple with what's left over um, in that shadow. Okay. Um, First point, this rethinking is really difficult, um, in part because moderation and all it entails has been, um, has appeared to be, and I think has been narrated as, something that's peripheral to what platforms do. And maybe the discussion in the last couple of years is helping to break that, but we've spent a long time thinking of moderation as kind of a side project, if we know about it at all. Um, the practices and the implications of moderating, of deciding who belongs on the site and what content's allowed, has been largely invisible to and hidden from most users, in part obscured by kind of rosy promises about participation, community, and democracy. The kind of rhetoric that platforms used to justify themselves and their services presented themselves as wide open spaces. Right? In fact, they made kind of like a three-part promise. One was that they were open and inviting to all forms of expression. Two is that they merely provided a technical shell in which anything can travel and they were going to be agnostic towards that content. And three, that as hosts of information, they were going to be impartial, they were going to be hands off, and they were going to embrace a kind of information wants to be free ethos. And there's a kind of contradiction in there where they said, we're going to do nothing to guide it, but this will guide towards progressive and democratic ends, right? A kind of like, politics through hands-offness, which already we should have been able to see was uh, kind of a tricky contradiction. Now, in practice, early on, these platforms soon discovered that they needed to moderate what their users posted. Um, when Facebook started, it actually relied on Harvard undergrads as volunteers to deal with all sorts of kind of customer service and complaint issues. Um, and it wasn't until the backlog of complaints reached the tens of thousands that they hired their first full-time employee. That was 18 months after they launched. Um, that's a lot better than some, so uh, it took Twitter until 2013 to get better than a month behind on their abuse tickets. Um, so at varying paces, these platforms recognized that part of their task was going to have to be dealing with problematic content, interpersonal disagreements, content that broke those stated rules. And this realization and the need to sort of build a moderation apparatus was exacerbated by aggressive expansion, expansion in the demographics these platforms were targeting, the regions in which they existed, and I think also the purposes to which the platforms claim to serve. But even as content moderation expanded as a part of what these platforms needed to do, in public and in their own sort of like performed understanding of themselves, they tended to disavow moderation as an element of what they had to do. Moderation was either non-existent in their self-descriptions, or it was imposed only at the edges. We can all agree trolls are bad, therefore we'll get rid of that. Thank you very much. 
uh, or when it was discussed, it was discussed as fair, benevolent, and impartial. The work of moderation was largely behind the scenes, was largely opaque to most users, obscured not only in the rhetoric about the platforms, but also in the interface itself. So finding where to complain, finding where the rules are, finding how to flag, following up uh, with the platform directly or through the interface. Um, and obscured and opaque even in the experience of their use. So we con continue to be invited to use these platforms and as if we're never going to encounter moderation. And the reality is many of us don't. Right? We don't end up reading the rules. We don't have content removed. And so the experience, it's sort of a, it reinforces the notion that these are open and flowing elements. It's important to note that there are plenty of users that have known from the start that moderation was happening because they ran up against it, fairly or unfairly. Um, but the offer of experience was a sort of um, uninterrupted one. And importantly, the labor involved in doing this was completely erased. It was very hard to see until some people started to dig it up and reveal it. Um, now, moderation is no longer nearly as invisible as we know. We've seen it on the front page of the newspapers. We've seen journalistic exposés. We've seen um, uh, regulatory discussions about whether there should be legal remedies. Um, and certainly some strong concerns around very particular moments, different controversies, people removed from sites, incidents that should have been handled, worries about how certain kinds of problematic information is circulating on these sites. And this is prompting really difficult public and scholarly and regulatory questions. And to me, they're part of a kind of broader interrogation of larger socio-technical systems that we find ourselves enmeshed in and implicated in, the kind of questions that I think the center is tackling, that our field is tackling, whether it's moderation, whether it's the ethics of AI, whether it's data privacy, a whole set of questions about the systems now in place. Um, so let me, see, let me try to make the case that we need to think of moderation differently. Rather than be, being peripheral, we need to think of moderation as central, conditional, and constitutional to what platforms are and how they function. Okay, so um, first, uh, the, the easy point, which is that moderation is central. Um, all platforms moderate. I imagine most people in this room understand that, but it's an important thing to keep saying because there's still an existing belief <coughs> That, um, that somehow platforms are unmoderated, or if you think Facebook is finicky, there must be some other platform that doesn't moderate. That is false. All platforms moderate, <laughs> and they always have. This means that platforms have some form of guidelines for content and behavior on their services. They reserve the right to police those sites for the content and behavior they deem unacceptable. They remove some content some of the time for some reason and they can enact penalties on users who violate or repeatedly violate those rules. Um, so Facebook has rules, 8chan has rules, right? specialty sites have rules, all the sites moderate. It's just a question of how they moderate according to what terms, how consistently, um, and, and with what kinds of uh, mechanisms around it. And I think that means that we can dispense with two fallacies right away. So one fallacy is the fallacy of moderation extremism. So when uh, a platform proposes to regulate some kind of content, um, there will be an argument about that as an intervention, which often implies that the opposite is no intervention. And I think that's false. Right? So if all platforms moderate in some way, then a new intervention is simply a shift in what's going to be regulated and what's not. But it's a powerful position to kind of describe platforms as if they allow all things, and that then somehow they're being uh, finicky or conservative about removing something. And the second fallacy is a kind of free speech extremism, right? So um, they attribute to platforms a kind of full-throated free speech defense. This is distinctly in the US, although in other places as well, that says the First Amendment says there can be no constraints. Therefore, anything that a platform does is some violation of someone's speech rights. That's a fallacy as well, right, for a number of reasons. First of all, the First Amendment isn't without its limitations. Second, the First Amendment applies to government interventions directly and only private ones indirectly, and there are competing theories about how that should apply to uh, private intermediaries anyway. But both of those positions rely on the sensibility that somehow there is a state of no moderation, and I don't think that exists. Okay. Um, the second is that moderation is conditional, and what I mean is like it's a condition of being a platform. So not only can platforms not survive without moderation, um, but they're, they aren't a platform without moderation. And I mean this in two ways. Um, one is that um, unmoderated platforms quickly become uh, 
porn slash spam slash chaos networks. Right? It's clear that people will use those platforms as available if the moderation is somehow inhibited, if the rules aren't being imposed. Um, and we know from a very early article by Julian DeBell and much research since then, um, that ungoverned platforms, when they are troubled, quickly become governed platforms. Right? Uh, the people that want to maintain the platform or the community as a space in which they can reasonably function will find that they have to impose some form of rulemaking and adjudication, whatever form that takes. And I would argue that a platform can't be a platform without moderation. It's definitional. Rather than thinking about, uh, about platforms as sort of open and flowing, think of them as cultivating, right? They, they offered to be better than the web. The web was an environment where things could be posted, and platforms said, here's where you'll do it better. Here's where you'll find the things you want. Here's where it'll be clear how it's organized. And that included not being overwhelmed by the things that the web had to offer. Pornography, spam, violence, threats, what have you. So the very promise of a platform implicitly is that it's a curated, organized, archived, and moderated phenomenon, even as the promise is it's an unfettered one. Um, and moderation is much more than policing. When we uh, worry about these concerns, we're worried about you know, the Christchurch shooter and their manifesto, we're worried about uh, you know, harassment attacks. We often focus on what could be done in response? Can we remove that person? Can we kick off the content? But I think if we expand the notion of moderation to recognize other techniques besides punitive ones, besides policing ones, we can quickly recognize that all design intervenes in some way. Every choice implies a set of values about what that choice is privileging and what it is you know, throttling. In fact, in some ways, the fundamental challenge of platforms is that they promise to be something while basing themselves on a raw material they can't predict. Right? Whatever users will provide, we're going to make that a feed that you'll want to read and you'll come back to again and again. Right? Um, so they have to turn freely given contributions, our raw material, into a flow of content that will somehow be produced as both engaging and tolerable. And they use a variety of levers for that, moderation just being one of them. So I would highlight that they moderate away stuff that might be troubling, they recommend things that might be engaging, uh, they curate up things that should be enticing, through design and norms, they indicate what the site is for. Uh, and then I think we have to think about more infrastructural things like, uh, like what content gets financial compensation and what doesn't. Um, what kind of users get special access to data tools and which ones don't, right? All of these structure who gets to provide, where that content goes, and what we're likely to see. And if the removal and the banning and suspending is just one dimension of that, this helps us rethink that these are conditions of what platforms have to offer, right? The semblance of an open space while also providing something engaging and curated, but in a way that seems hands-off. Um, and then the third part was to say that moderation is in some ways constitutional, and what I mean is that, is that it constitutes what the platform is for its users and even for itself. Um, so the guidelines that uh, platforms offer, what you can and cannot do, they're my favorite documents to read, not because of the list of things you can't do, but the first paragraph. The first paragraph is always something like, this is a platform where you can find community. We privilege speech over all things. We encourage, it's got this lovely positive, you know, um, window dressing perhaps, but a very sort of positive notion of what the site is, followed by the long list of things you can't do, right? It is at a very moment saying, this is what we are and this is what we're for. It's an articulation of values. Right. Sometimes that proclaimed sense of purpose is generic and sounds like PR. Something is, sometimes it's quite specific. But it is constituting for users what that site is. And I think this is most clear when those things change. So Tumblr recently changed its rules about nudity. It had been one of the more permissive sites across kind of the large scale, wide, uh, widely known ones where expressions of sexuality, naked bodies, you could, you know, there was a lot more room for that, pornography. Um, and then they abruptly changed their rules, and there are a whole set of reasons why that might be. But the reaction wasn't just, oh, I post those kinds of photos, I guess I can't use Tumblr. It was bigger than that. It was something like, you've killed Tumblr for me. Tumblr was a kind of place. And it was a kind of place even for people who didn't post images that would ever get banned during that crackdown, right? It represented something. It constituted the site as different than Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, right? 
Um, and that entity had to do with its moderation policy and the relative permissiveness about it, about sexuality and um, nudity, that when that policy changed, it was experienced more than just a new rule that would have to be adhered to, but a shift in the very ethos of the site. Right? Whether that's a fair characterization or not, whether those practices could persist or not, the experience for many was you, you change something fundamental about Tumblr. And in many ways, uh, moderation also constitutes the platform internally for its own, uh, for the company itself. The flow of decisions and labor, the investment of technology and resources and people, the very shape of the company itself is being reshaped around the work of content moderation. When I started doing interviews for this book and talked to people who were doing content moderation at these platforms, they often felt very isolated. One of the stories I heard was, we're over here trying to worry about things like harassment and the people who design the platform don't hear us. That's different now, right? That's different in part because of the public scrutiny and the kind of risk that platforms face if they get this wrong, public risk, regulatory risk. Um, the very shape of the companies are changing around content moderation. Um, Robin Kaplan has pointed out really effectively that they've become an, an institutionalized part of the structure of the organization, literally the, like, the, the flow of decision making. Um, they shape what the platforms invest in. They shape their commitment to certain kinds of technologies. They shape how the platforms think about their users. Right? So they don't only, only constitute the platform for us as potential users, but they even constant, constitute the platform for itself as a company. Okay. The problem of moderation as it's being imagined is seen as enormous, and that's in part because these platforms are enormous, or at least the ones we tend to worry about the most. Right? When we worry about how Facebook handles this, how Twitter handles this, how YouTube handles this, one of the truths or one of the received understandings for the platforms themselves is that the enormity of the content makes this a very particular kind of problem. And these platforms are enormous. They're enormous in terms of the number of users. They're enormous in terms of the amount of content that is flowing through them. They're enormous in terms of the scope on the globe in which they touch. Right? Um, and that certainly is matched by the scale of the problem as it's conceived. Right? So that sense of scale, the sense of like how would you address the problem of harassment or the problem of hate speech or the problem of pornography in a site that doesn't allow it, um, the, the prominent experience for these platforms is that this is the enormity of the problem. And this shapes the kind of solutions that they're thinking about. It also shapes the very way they think about the problem. And I think there's an interesting and maybe unresolvable tension, this isn't up here in the quote, but I'll just say it while you read, is that um, the largest platforms experience moderation as a problem at the scale of data, right? How do you have millions of pieces of content flowing through the system all the time? How do you ferret out the ones that you shouldn't allow? And how do you act upon them in a timely fashion given the sheer amount of stuff, right? And things like issues erupt like around news events, right? So they're sort of unpredictable and they scale very rapidly. On the other hand, the experience of being moderated is always at the intimate scale. My photo was removed. Why? That's not fair. What did they think of my photo? Why does Facebook think my photo should come down, right? And it's very hard for the platforms to think about this, to grapple with this at an individual level. And it's very hard for us in, this, in the interaction of moderation to say, well, I guess I'm you know, part of a percentage of people who fell below a threshold given that there are millions of pieces of content, right? The contrast between a kind of data scale thinking and an intimate scale for how we experience moderation may be unresolvable. Um, but there are two kind of approaches that uh, the platforms seem to want to take that are very much shaped by this notion that given the scale, there are only kind of two kinds of solutions that can be managed. Um, the first is, sorry, that was supposed to all click together. Let me just, uh, rip, rip, pop. Okay. Um, the first is through human labor. Um, there's an en enormous commitment to human labor at the biggest of platforms to do this work. So for instance, Facebook has 60 plus people internally full-time, depending on how you count, doing the work of content moderation. That means crafting policy, responding to specific incidents, working with outside partners, um, uh, et cetera. 
But that's just the start. And many people have pointed out, I would point you to the work of Sarah Roberts, who's done immensely important work on this. Um, Mary Gray, who has a book coming out about crowd work in general, that much of this work is now being outsourced to crowd work of various sorts. And this is at an enormous scale. So in 2018, I don't know if they met this goal, YouTube promised to have 10,000 people um, working on this at any one time. Facebook promised 20,000. That's an enormous number of people. Now, most of those are working outside of Menlo Park. Uh, they're working in other parts of the world. They are clicking through content, um, often in very sort of like problematic labor conditions um, and psychological conditions. So there's a big question to ask about this. But the one answer is throw many, many people at the problem. Um, and let's go further, right? That's also, um, we don't just have crowd work, we also have flaggers, right? So users are invited to do this work. Um, we sometimes rate our own content depending on the platform, so all users are enlisted in this. If we think about the labor of moderation, it's not the 10 to 60 people sitting at a platform, right? It's an enormous set of people who are enlisted in the process of helping to decide what belongs and what doesn't. In some ways, platforms don't just distribute content, they also distribute responsibility and they distribute work. Who's gonna manage this flow of information, right? And what is retained with us, whatever the us is, and what is farmed out to various other communities. And the second solution, not surprisingly, is that um, this could be sort of automated away, right? That the answer to the scale problem is um, technical, right? That maybe at some point, if not now, that we'll have a technical solution to identifying all of that harmful and problematic and disruptive content uh, and whisking it away quickly. Already, more than half of the flags that Facebook receives, it, they're receiving from their own software. Right? So the software isn't good enough to decide to remove something, but it will flag something and say, this is likely to be pornography, this is likely to be harassment, and it will put it in the queue for the human labor review. Right? That means that most content that is removed is removed before anyone ever sees it, which is also interesting. Right? Um, maybe that's good because you're worried about the harm of that content. Maybe that's bad because it's not being seen and addressed by human eyes. Um, I don't think content moderation can ever be fully automated, and I don't think it should be. Um, so why it can't be? Um, identifying known content is hard enough when you have a database of bad images, as we do with child pornography. Even finding that is difficult, but that is nothing compared to the problem, the technical problem of identifying new cases. Is this porn pornography? Is this hate speech? Is this harassment? Not is this a copy of something I had before that I decided was harassment or hate speech. And most of the benefit, most of the advantage that the platforms have been trumpeting over the last year or so, where they said much more of our moderation is automated, has had to do with copies, right? That they've moderated away something once and they've kept it, and now they identify it again and they don't have to re-decide, right? Which comes with its own problems. Then there are all the problems that we know, that this group knows about data science, right? That context and human judgment are incredibly important and they're very hard things for machine learning techniques to identify that there can be biases in the training data. Most of these platforms are using their own previous decisions as training data on how to move forward. We know why that can be a problem. Um, and that the false positives and false negatives are too persistent to act on directly, right? So if you can never approximate it such that you can act on it automatically, you always have a human labor problem. Someone still has to review it, right? It's just been brought to their attention in a different way. But I would say this differently. So, whether it's human labor or software detection, the perspective on how to moderate at scale tends toward what I would call automated solutions. Software is automated. Can we identify this thing automatically with a technology? But the human labor is automated too, right? It's given a massive proce procedural guideline. This counts as a violation, this doesn't, right? This much skin is okay, this much skin is not. And it's broken down. We've seen journalistic exposés of these like, you know, pages and pages long guidelines that the crowd workers get that help them to identify what counts as hate speech and what doesn't, right? And you can pick through them and find all sorts of problems with them. Problems in a sense that you disagree with how it's been broken down, how the definition of hate speech has been applied to 19 different cases, right? Or how these kind of recognition factors get um, proceduralized, right? But the dream is if we're gonna have 10,000 people looking at content, we don't have perfect adjudication. We don't have justice. The best we can have is consistency, right? 
But consistency requires getting all those people to act and think the same way. So they have to be turned into automata of a sort. I'm not using that as a pejorative, right? But it requires a proceduralized and mechanized solution, whether that's being enacted by people or software or in most cases both. I'm describing the approaches of kind of the largest platforms. Many platforms we use still have a much more kind of ad hoc way of doing this. Pinterest has like 14 people who do this. Medium has like five. They don't farm out a lot of content to either software or um, uh, you know, crowd work. That approach is very different, right? It's been called an artisanal approach um, that has its own kind of problems, mostly about keeping up, right? Um, but we're seeing this move towards a massive kind of labor solution or a software solution. Um, I'm going to skip that page. Even more importantly than whether it can be solved, I want to argue that it shouldn't be solved. So whether the platform in question does this adjudication thoughtfully or not, um, selfishly or not, consistently or not. You may have one platform that you go, they're doing a terrific job. They get it. They're sensitive to this. Another platform that's like, boy, they're clumsy about this. In both cases, this is a kind of what I've been calling a customer service approach. You tell us what the violation is. We'll handle it for you we'll retain the adjudicative process. We might farm out the work to crowd workers or flaggers or you know, uh, support teams, but we'll retain the judgment and we will apply that judgment on behalf of the users. And I wonder if this entire approach is itself the limiting factor, is itself the problem, right? For two reasons. One is that even 99% accuracy is a half measure when it comes to the most divisive contested issues. Right? There was a dispute about the famous terror of war photo and Facebook removing it in a couple of contexts. And newspaper editors saying, how could you? This is historic and important. Right? It is historic and important. It includes child nudity. What's the right answer? Did Facebook get it wrong? According to some. And they got it right according to others. And there were plenty who disputed their decision and they changed their decision. But the question of um, if Facebook had allowed it and there'd been no controversy, that still would have been a decision on our behalf. And I would argue that it might be that the most, that the way we work out public values is by working them out publicly. And so the moderation approach, even when it's done well, is removing that deliberative process from the public venue. Presuming that public values exist and can be approximated rather than that public values have to be contested again and again and again. Right? And it's through these moments where we say, my God, the newspaper published that photo. Is that okay? Is that what we want? Is that newsworthy or is that graphic? It's both and we dispute it and there is no answer. The answer might be right for some and not for others, but it's the process of having that deliberation that maybe is the messy way in which we move forward. So maybe even effective content moderation, if it's done on our behalf, is structurally problematic. It is easy to focus on Facebook. It's a fun punching bag. It's easy to focus on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Reddit, Instagram as sort of like the biggest, hottest, clumsiest examples of this. Um, but I think it's really important to expand our notion of where these things are happening. So in the book, I try to highlight that these questions are being considered at, uh, you know, in gaming worlds, at app stores, um, in collaboration sites, that that kind of moderation that Facebook engages with is also something that Wikipedia engages with or um, you know, major gaming sites deal with or journalistic sites that have common threads deal with. And the problem changes by scope and it changes by purpose, but it's still kind of like asking a lot of the same questions. And as we see sort of emergent new forms of where users can contribute content, where they're invited to do it and then there is some cultivated sense of what belongs there, we're going to see the same kind of problems. And there's a range of them. So it should be telling that the guy who currently runs Trust and Safety at Airbnb used to run content moderation at Facebook, right? This is a regulation of content, of activity that's largely off-platform. Did you have a camera in your apartment? Did you exclude someone by the, based on the color of their skin, right? But that same model that says the platform, the intermediary, has some responsibility to curate the activities of users is awfully similar to how Facebook thinks about this. 
But I want to go farther because I think we're um, seeing another question. I've just begun to sort of dig into this of maybe what I'd call like infrastructural moderation, right? So let me give you two examples. So um, one was that uh, after the um, protest and the death in Charlottesville, um, the web hosting site Cloudflare decided to kick off Daily Stormer, which was a white nationalist slash Nazi publication community that had been around for a long time, um, and wrote a very interesting and problematic document about why they did it. The guy who runs Cloudflare did it. He couldn't stand it anymore. And he recognized that it was a very dangerous decision for him to summarily remove this group, and he did it. And he said, we probably shouldn't be doing things like this, but I'm doing it. Really interesting problem. Um, they were also removed from GoDaddy. They were also removed from Google's web hosting. And then there was a really interesting incident where um, Microsoft, my own sort of benefactor, um, nearly almost briefly banned Gab. Gab used at the time Azure Cloud Computing, which is a Microsoft service for web hosting and sort of data analytics and all that, um, like Amazon Web Services as a Microsoft's competitor. Um, received a complaint about anti-Semitic content on Gab. Gab is kind of like right-wing alternative to Twitter that has been widely hosting white nationalist and anti-Semitic hateful content. Um, and Microsoft sent a letter, sort of a customer service person sent a letter to Gab and said, you've got to remove this stuff. It's against our terms of service. Gab made a stink about it. They were like, look, we're being shut down by Microsoft. Um, and it all got worked out because Microsoft said, oh, that we were supposed to sort of handle this as a client to client thing and now we've asked them to leave and they went ahead and left and then they also got kicked off of Medium, Google Play, Apple App Store, PayPal, Stripe, GoDaddy, Joyent, and Shopify. Now, however you feel about Gab and the kind of speech that it is willing to host, and again, Gab moderates too, it just doesn't moderate in the terms that most of us would be thrilled with. Um, the kind of moderation decisions about whether Gab and the kind of speech it allows should be hosted or should, be, uh, should receive payment services, like from Stripe or PayPal, is running up against a concern articulated by whoever complained about this or um, uh, organizations like Sleeping Giants saying, you shouldn't host this kind of content. This should be against your rules. We're seeing political action shifting uh, its eye towards not just the social media platforms, but these other kind of service providers that similarly inhabit this space of, we promise to be a provider for all, but we also have terms of use, and we kind of don't like to trumpet the fact that we actually could act on them because being distant and impartial works better for us, and yet we don't want to tolerate hate speech. Or we might find ourselves the target of new laws in Australia, new laws being considered in the UK, that says hate, but hate speech has to be removed rapidly. Does that mean Twitter? Does that mean Amazon Web Services? Right? So we have to expand the idea of where moderation lives to arguably sort of like every edge in the network. Every edge in the network is potentially a place where terms adhere. Some of them are more visible, some of them are harder to see, but they become a part of the information ecosystem. And that raises two problems. One is one about consistency, right? So we worry about the idea of deplatforming. Alex Jones was deplatformed, meaning he was removed not just from one site, but from all, many of the sites, right? And that can include not just places where he can post content, but maybe web hosting and payment services, right? So the kind of consistency across <coughs> decision making has an effect that any one site doesn't. You get kicked off of Instagram, maybe you can post somewhere else, but you get kicked off on all of them, that is a different implication. Maybe the right one, maybe the wrong one. And there's also a worry about inconsistency, right? So if each of these players has their own rules, it's hard to anticipate whose rules affect you, whether they can change, then the flow of information from having it and supporting it and hosting it and storing it and finding users and authenticating all depend on players that can or cannot, will or will not impose their own moderating rules. In fact, they do. The question is, which ones and with what effect? Okay. I've gone on longer than I want to go. Let me finish with three thoughts. Three lessons that I think we can take. If we really do rethink moderation as central, conditional, and constitutional to what platforms do, as unsolvable, either because it can't be solved or shouldn't be solved, and that it's all the way down, that it's not just Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Instagram, but it's all of these places that touch or support communication online, then I think there are a couple lessons we can take away. From the first, if moderation really is central, definitional to what platforms are, 
then setting aside the scholarship that some people in this room, some people in our field have done that's about moderation, that's about <laughs> platform affordances, that's about community management, how much scholarship in our broader field has treated social media like an open and level playing field? And how much of that research is now sour? Because it was talking about what do humans do, and what it should have been talking about was what do humans do in a context in which some activities are cultivated, some are prohibited, some users are aware of that, some are not. Some are facing those mechanisms and trying to gain them, some are unaware of them, right? If that's fundamentally what it means to participate in platforms, then what do we do with all that scholarship that says friendship is like this, politics is like this, human contact is like this, expertise is like this, without a real understanding that this is a cultivated and a constructed environment in which people are participating. The second, if moderation is unsolvable, then how do we deal with these new calls for greater responsibility, greater oversight, regulatory oversight? Um, greater responsibility is good, but how will those calls take into account what moderation should be, what public contestation could be? If these are not just social media problems, right, bad actors on good platforms, but are actually fundamental to the question of we do battle around values, politics, and identity through cultural expression. We always do. We always have to balance the right to speak with the safety of community, with the health of debate. Those are never resolvable tensions. Um, we always worry about the implications of intermediaries, and especially commercially motivated intermediaries, hosting what needs to be public culture. Um, and the imposition of oversight itself can have beneficial and problematic effects. How are we going to ask those questions? How are we going to answer those questions? I think that's a solution space that we've seen so far. AI is going to solve it. We can have harsh exceptions like FOSTA for sort of like sex trafficking. Uh, what the Europeans and the Australians are doing, be much faster and much more responsive about things like hate speech. Even kind of antitrust break up the big platforms. This seems to me like a very limited set of solution ideas. It's not rethinking the fundamental relationship to advertising. It's not rethinking our commitment to immediacy. It's not rethinking the question of scale. And it's not rethinking who does the moderating. Where is the voice of the governed in this process? I called the book Custodians of the Internet for two reasons. One was that oftentimes the people who did content moderation like to describe themselves as kind of janitors. They could just sweep up in the same way the janitors are kind of invisible, and that's problematic, but the way they're like, oh, things just get handled. Like, don't worry, you have your meeting and have your discussion, and the trash will be empty by the morning, right? That this is a janitorial work. But by the end, I want to try on the other meaning of custodian. Like, what does it mean to be um, a committed keeper of a process? Not that a platform is going to decide for us what we don't want to see, but it is actually going to host the difficult problem of governance for others to decide. Could they take on that custodial role? And here's the last problem. If moderation isn't just a problem of the big platforms, but is actually at every point in the flow of information, if every choice to intervene or not lives at every edge we encounter, and if the terms of service and the community guidelines adhere in every point on the network, and the entire apparatus, not just each platform, but the entire apparatus is, turns out to be an intricate accelerant that is optimized for certain kinds of things like engagement, and is only partially understood by its makers, and that the global flows of information and sociality depend on this complex interwoven network, then I think we need to think about not just the politics and ethics of speech or intermediaries, but of something like affiliation and infrastructurality. Right? We need a policy for information that comprehends and copes and maybe even harnesses this, um, maybe a more networked notion of responsibility for a more networked ecosystem. I'll stop there. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'd also like to note that we are live streaming on the internet. We have a number of people joining us via that stream right now. Um, because this is a soft opening, mm. we're allowed to make mistakes. Ooh, did I? And um, you're, no, okay. not yet. It's I have 15 possible. minutes, though. Yeah. Good. Um, but um, what I meant to say by that is that we are actually not going to be taking questions from the internet, although we hope to work that out in our next term speaker series. But yeah. we are taking questions from the room, and this is your cue to ask them. And my Twitter handle is Charlton G. So if you're on live stream and you want to pose a question, I may not get to it this afternoon, but I'll try to get to it. Charlton G. That's very generous. Yeah. yeah. And so um, 
Yeah, so uh, in the back, <coughs> and then um, we do need to wait for the mic because of the live stream. Hi, uh, thank you for the great talk. Thanks. It was really interesting. Uh, there's a movement within uh, the field of machine learning to try to focus on algorithms that are more uh, transparent yeah. and fair. Um, the, the fat star movement. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the potential of that movement as a way forward on sort of the problem of moderation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, great question. So uh, my first reaction is that for all sorts of reasons, that movement in machine learning is a great idea. That um, the transparency of where data comes from and how to sort of explain conclusions that are reached, which has its own technical challenges, is a really good exercise. Um, I see two hurdles. One is that because moderation is supposed to happen behind the scenes, I'm not sure where the transparency of the tools might be transparent to the people who are deploying them, but it's another level too to make it transparent to the users who might be subject to them. Um, which is not to it's not to un it's not to undercut that purpose, but there's like another leap before it could be useful in this context because that moderation for so long has been sort of withheld for us. Right, and in some cases against us. Um, and, and then the second question is sort of like, um, while I want those tools to be more transparent and accountable and careful, I also worry about the faith that if we do that right, these are gonna be end solutions to the problem. I do think that I would love to see more development in ML environments for tools that, um, don't do the detecting for us, but support the deliberation around detection. So I think there's like another dimension where um, the kind of collective work that would be necessary for a group to adjudicate to some degree could be supported by a set of tools that understand something from data and give people workable information. I'd like to know how much like things that are removed is this? How outside of some sphere is this? Maybe that's a useful tool. But it's not meant to say it should be treated as X. It's more like this gives you the ability to judge it in a certain way. I'm not expert enough to know how to move that forward. But I don't want to dismiss the possibility that sort of ML techniques have a lot to offer. I think they do. There was someone in the middle here. <coughs> Hi, um, what do you think about cases where both the users and maybe also like the internal moderators have standards for content moderation that maybe are not no. acceptable? Yeah, yeah. This is a great question, right? Because I think in some ways we, we don't like the fact that what we're doing is we're dealing with who claims things are acceptable. And even as researchers, we come at it with a sense of like, dear God, this harassment is horrible, and oh my God, wouldn't it be great if this went away? And someone else has a very different take on that. Um, so I think I think that if we look in, not at sort of how Facebook and Twitter and YouTube have struggled with this, but how Reddit has struggled with this, we can see that question much more clearly. So Reddit made a move that the other ones didn't early on that said, we're gonna move the moderation out to the, to the community structure. So if you form a subreddit, as the administrator, you're also the moderator, right? And we're gonna give you tools to do that, but we're gonna let you impose those rules, by and large, on your own, right? Um, and all they did was kind of facilitate how to do that, give you the mechanisms to do it. Um, and in some ways that's really powerful because a group can say, these are our norms, right? If we are a um, surviving mastectomy group, then there's gonna be pictures of mastectomy photos. And we can say, look, you're here for that. Don't be surprised it's there. And if someone flags one, we're gonna say, sorry, that's, that's okay, right? So in some ways they solve that problem of like different value systems trying to coexist on the same platform. They run into the opposite problem, which is if you and I think it's fine to circulate stolen celebrity nude photos, and so do the moderators, and we're all like, good, right? Then it's gonna go on. And what Reddit was faced with was, it still has to have a, a, a base set of standards, and it had largely foregone that move until it was faced with criticism. Criticism not coming from contesting people inside the community, but people outside saying, how could you let this happen because of its consequences for someone else, not because someone in the group said, I'm troubled by this, because no one was. Um, so I think in some ways, if you imagine those two poles reaching somewhere in the middle, offering out more moderation to the group, but not letting go of the fact that there can also be a base standard, and none of those are easy, right? In fact, it's now two decisions you have to make, right? What do you, how do you facilitate 
collective group moderation that may differ and how do you set a standard that still has to be imposed. Um, but I think in, in some way that gets at that question of allowing both collective agency and public harm questions to be grappled with. Hi, uh, this is a question about gatekeeping uh, yeah. in ethics research itself. Yeah. Uh, it seems increasingly that uh, large for-profit corporations like Facebook, Microsoft yep. are setting the agenda uh, and becoming gatekeepers themselves. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, uh, do you believe that there's a risk of creating a blind spot towards the actions of those companies like Microsoft's ongoing support of imprisonment and abuse of uh, asylum seekers at yeah. the border, yeah. and if that risk exists, is there a way to mitigate it? Yeah, it's a huge risk, absolutely, right? So in some ways, and my colleagues at Microsoft Research have felt this way, it is really important to push ethical questions into the discussion inside of these companies. So the first glimpse is like, great, that's great that they're set up an ethics board and they're taking that seriously, right? The, the immediate risk is that that leads the discussion, compartmentalizes the range of the question. Um, so there's two problems. One is like, which questions will simply not get asked? And the other is, when there's an ethical question that comes up that somehow doesn't fit that framework or seems important enough to the business that it can be dismissed. There's nothing certain about the fact of an ethics board actually doing ethics well. Um, and so an ethics board that's inside a company is, there's always a risk and there's always an internal tension about how well that board can discuss things that seem fundamental to that company itself, right? Um, and I think we're seeing that discussion, we're certainly seeing it in Microsoft, we're certainly seeing it at Google and Amazon around facial recognition, about drones, about policing. Um, it, the optimistic version of it is like, the fact that the ethics conversation has pushed itself into the conversation inside the company means there's more room for someone to say, hey, this client we have, we shouldn't have, or this tool we're developing shouldn't. Uh, and the pessimistic one is like, oh, it's lovely that that conversation is happening and it looks like window dressing and then nothing changes when it comes to bottom line. Um, I don't know the answer to those things, but you're absolutely right that that is the risk. And it means that that question, the people who are internal to the companies who are having that ethics discussion need the resources of people who are separate from those and are having those discussion elsewhere to prove that that discussion exists and has to have a certain shape. If you're gonna talk about ethics, you have to talk about these five things. You may not wanna talk about the fifth one, because it works against your business, but look, that's the discussion now. So it can't just happen in those environments. But I wouldn't want the opposite, which is like, great, academics and civil society are having the discussion, and the corporations can say, thank you. Um, I think we need both, and it's still not a perfect measure. up to you. <laughs> one over here. You can think on it. Hi, um, You spoke about the deliberative mode of figuring it out and sort of the move towards moving that out, this way of figuring it out deliberatively. People <laughs> go back and forth on standards yeah. and sort of evolve standards as they come along. But this also sits along the side of these publicly listed companies, often viewing them or conceptualizing them as public relation problems. Yeah of trying to cross over that new cycle. Yeah. And when it has clear sort of linkages to their share prices and things like that, yeah. it's always the sense of how do we get this to go away as quickly sure. as possible. Sure. So how do we think about, or how do you get platforms to, onto the table to think yeah. about you know, this public sort of deliberative mode as something that's healthy in the long term yeah. when their business model, especially with respect to advertising, with respect to you know showing user numbers, things like that, is all incentivized towards making this go away as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think in some ways, what I wish is to be able to turn back the clock, right? Because having spent a decade saying, this is gonna work fine and you'll never have to worry about moderation and we don't have a troll problem, and then realizing they have one and being faced with it in the press and from angry users and activists, means that the inclination is how do we quickly get back to that experience that it's all working smoothly. And if the notion that these weren't just tools through which to publish, but they were also tools through which to create collective forms of governments, if that had been more prominent from the start, and I think it was in many kind of like earlier web incarnations, and somehow we've let go of that notion. So I can't roll the clock back, so in some ways then it requires something like 
continued political pressure. And I do think that in the last year or two, we have seen movement, now whether that movement is dramatic, genuine, sustained, or whether it is um, performed and limited, is hard to tell yet, maybe different for different platforms. Um, at, at the very least, recognizing that this is not just a news cycle that burns for two days and then goes away, but that it's accumulating as an ongoing concern. In the US, the best movement for this is threatened regulation, because uh, American companies would much prefer self-regulation, so oftentimes the moment where we begin to say, um, we might just bring an antitrust case, they go, ha, da, 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 okay, da, da, okay, all right, all right, we're gonna really solve this problem. And then you have to watch, like, did they, right, and did that, was, was that a half measure? Um, but I feel like that's been a story we can look at previous information industries and media industries. I mean, that's a gloss, but I think that, that the threat of regulation has had beneficial implications, um, but it's a kicking and screaming problem. Their hand up already in the back. Someone had their hand up earlier. Okay. Hi. Um, so uh, these user moderators on these platforms—they're often, you know, providing value to the platform, yeah. kind of volunteered. Yeah. Um, but they are doing it out of the kindness of their own heart, or you know, they just want to see that their own use of the platform succeeds. Yeah. But um, is it okay that? their work is unpaid. Uncompensated, yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, there's kind of a different model out there, and I'm thinking probably of things like Twitch or things like Wikipedia or Reddit as an example, that rely on kind of a community structure, whether that's kind of classic small community or whether that's you know a borrowed community structure on a much larger scale. Um, and it often does depend on people who are kind of there to support the community and want to see it thrive. And that notion of this is the volunteer work that you're willing to commit to the platform has, has survived. Um, I, I know there are people who would say turning that into a paid task changes something. I worry that that's an excuse not to pay people, so I think that it's better to say um, what, would a, what would an equitable sharing be here, right? And at least have the platform be willing to recognize that much of its value, and this is part of the problem of like, where does the platform see its value? Um, oftentimes moderation is a support task in their eyes, right? It's not the thing that generates activity, engagement that generates activity, and cleaning up the mess does. We can see it and say, you know, if people were just, you know, um, flaming each other all through the discussion, people are gonna leave. Um, and so that threat is always there, but it's always hard to monetize, right, to sort of explain that role as one that brings in value and therefore should share in that value, but I think it's the right question, right? And maybe this move to say, here's the Reddit example, that's one extreme, it gets some things right and it has this failing, and here's the Facebook example, it's the other extreme, and it gets some things right and has this failing. Maybe the move to the middle that shares that is also gonna have to think about sharing the revenue in some way, but a way that both acknowledges the labor and also honors that the labor is driven by many things. I think our question queue is full, so we're going to be brief. Okay. So you said a second ago, industries don't want to be regulated, but I would disagree with that a little okay. bit. I think a lot of why this has fallen on the industry is because of Section 230. Mm -hmm. um, and ironically, recently, there's been uh, some pushes against Section 230. I've always thought of it as bulletproof, but from the right, there's been some pushes against Section 230. Right. What do you see as kind of the future of that regulation? Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. So, and, and there's, there's both the like, Comfort with the regulation, I mean, I think Section 230 is just a liability shield, right? Um, it protects them. The, the law says that platforms can't be held liable for the activity of their users unless it's a federal crime. And if they moderate, if they kick people off, that doesn't make them liable. So they're protected if they don't moderate, and they're protected if they do moderate, and there's no set of expectations about how to moderate or any, any sort of obligation matching with it. So you're right, it doesn't surprise me that's a regulation that many platforms really enjoy because it keeps them out of court or it keeps them winning in court. Um, and I think there's an additional one which is sometimes there are these platforms that would like to make a distinction. We would like to get rid of fraudulent loan offers. But they don't want to be the one that has to decide who's fraudulent. So what they want is the Better Business Bureau to tell them or the Southern Poverty Law Center to tell them or you know, someone to say these are the bad actors and then they can say good, we're gonna act on your criteria. So it's not as if they want to be freewheeling. I think Section 230 weirdly comes with no matching obligation. So many past US regulatory models that offered an industry something to help it grow 
um, came with a matching obligation, maybe a flimsy one, maybe one that was easy to dodge around, um, and 230 came with nothing. So to me, there's lots of ways to say, I don't want the US government to decide what to remove, but to say, you must share best practices, you must make your ML tools public and accountable, you must have an appeals process that is known, you must be able to be audited by, you know, acknowledged scholars. There's lots of ways you could say, this is a task that it's bad to do wrong and it's bad to do in the shadows, so let's oblige you to do it the right way. And if you do that, you enjoy the liability shield that 230 offers, where we won't then sue you for every single bad piece of material that someone doesn't like. This is our last super brief comment or question. Yeah, and I can hang around a little bit after if you didn't get your chance. Um, yeah, I was uh, wondering what you saw, like the parallel similarities and maybe differences between content moderation online and content moderation in like the real world, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if I put like a post outside my office or like a talk like this, like is the internet just like that but worse or is it fundamentally different and needs fundamentally different solutions? I think it's a really good lesson to remember that the places that don't seem moderated are moderated in all sorts of ways, right? There are sort of campus rules, I'm sure. There are norms of your community. Um, there are all sorts of mechanisms that shape what we do in punitive and non-punitive ways. And really what we're dealing with here is both the like lack of a substrate, right? So you don't have a built-in community if, with which you might have to remove or be sanctioned, and the commercial power that's driving it, right? So that exacerbates some of the problems where some of those tactics don't exist and some of them are quite problematic. Well, this is the final talk in the series for this term, but please check out our website at esc.umich.edu for future events. And let's conclude by thanking our speaker. Great. Thank you. Thanks.